All right, welcome back, everybody. I just want to let you know that I am super, super, super excited about our next speaker. Because <laughs> it's me. Yay. Uh, me. Uh, my name is Gregor McDougall, uh, and this is my talk called Scaling Solidus. Uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to be soliciting questions using this fancy thing that Google added. So at the top of the slides, you can see a little link to a URL. You can go there, post your questions in there, upvote people, downvote trolls, whatever you want. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm just going to go through, post some questions, answer people in there. So throughout the, throughout the talk, if you have the interesting things to, to think about, uh, please go there and, and, and enter some questions. Uh, my name is Gregor McDougall, as I mentioned. I work at Stembolt, and I am a member of the Solidus Core team. While most of the Stembolt team is based on the west coast of Canada in Victoria, I am actually based in Toronto. It is a big city in Canada that, uh, as opposed to what many Americans think, is not near Victoria. It is very far away from Victoria. You can actually see my apartment in one of these buildings. I won't show you which one, but it's, it's one of them. Uh, the question is, uh, what do I do? I am a writer of code. I program on a fairly daily basis. And I also suggest people what to do and suggest to people what to not to do. I don't like to tell people. I don't like to be too heavy handed. I like to offer kind and gentle suggestions. One of my friends recently gave me a, an anecdote where I was trying to suggest someone to something. And his response was, Generally, in my experience, if Gregor suggests the same thing to you over and over and over again in a very short period of time, you might want to really seriously consider doing that. Personally, I am a big board game fan. I like to play a lot of board games. Uh, these are board games that are probably significantly more challenging and lengthy than what people normally think of when they think of board games. I like to play complex economic games that take about four to six hours to play. And that's my, a relaxing weekend for me. Many people uh, will uh, know about my reputation. I have a bit of a reputation in the office for board gaming that if you like to win board games, you should not play with Gregor. This is the way it goes. I have a, a bit of an analytical mind. Uh, it makes me a, a pretty good programmer and a pretty good board gamer. So someday, if you're in a place where I am, you break out of board games, let's go. I love the theater. I really like the theater. I've been to a lot of theater. Uh, people generally ask me, because they know I really love theater, if they're looking for recommendations on things. Uh, they tend to get what I would describe would probably be an extremely thorough response into what show they should see when they're in a particular town. Uh, I hope it's valued, but it's something that I really like. I love living in Toronto because it's got a great theater scene. I go to Broadway all the time because it's not that far away. And I'm super excited this, this weekend because I'm going to get to see my first West End shows. So I'm going to hit all the big theater locations. I'm really happy about it. I like Star Trek. Uh, well, I, I watch Star Trek. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go with that one. Uh, there's a channel in Stemble that I started up recently where I can point out all the logical flaws that make me hate Star Trek. And yet I keep watching it. I can't explain why. My partner saw me rewatching Voyager recently and asked the question, why are you doing this to yourself? And I don't have a good answer. But I watch a lot of Star Trek. Uh, aside from that, I, I like sports. Uh, I like popular sports, like baseball is a popular sport in Canada and North America, not so popular here. Uh, I'm a fan of the Toronto Blue Jays because they uh, play like five minutes away from where I live, and that's amazing. The thing is, I'm not just into like super popular sports, I also like weird sports. So I also have a reputation of being the person who knows the rules to a lot of sports. So I can also be the person who explains to you what the infield fly rule is and how it works. But I can also tell you the difference between a triple flip and a quad sal cow. That's just the kind of person I am. I know that the Brits are really big into football. Uh, this kind of football, the one you use your feet, uh, not the American kind of football, which is you use your hands. I don't know why. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, that it, people are not familiar with is that uh, due to some uh, rampant hooliganism back in the 80s and such, they banned alcohol from the stadiums. Then the football fans said, yeah, well, right enough. Uh, so you can't drink there. So the people who like to drink and go to sports, they found a new sport. They found darts. <laughs> if you're not from Britain, this, may, this picture may surprise you to see a very, very large number of people in an arena watching a very, very, very small dartboard well into the distance. Uh, this is a very strange atmosphere, if you've ever seen it. Uh, aside from the people dressing up, if you want to get a good idea of what a darts atmosphere is like, I recommend you come by the Mineries tonight at about 9, 9.30. I think that'll be what it's like. So 
that introduction out of the way, let's talk about Solidus. We're going to talk about scalability. And Black Friday is what? Like June, July, August, September. Yeah, you know, a little ways away. So I don't need to worry about it yet, right? Solidus is just a web app. At its core, we're going to talk about scalability, and we're going to talk about scalability of web apps. We're going to talk about stacks. We're going to talk about fancy things like that. You're not going to find uh, too many super tricks in here, Solidus. I peppered in a few one of these. But generally, if you know how to build a scalable web app that, that uh, sells Furbies online, or a scalable web app that offers uh, you know, relationship advice, you're going to find it's going to be pretty much the same either way. One of the biggest keys uh, of this talk is I want to talk about my four major goals of this. I want to talk about how you can configure a scalable Solidus stack. We're going to look at how you can identify your bottlenecks that are in your application. We're going to learn how we can simulate load in your application and how we can implement changes that are, are going to make the biggest <coughs> impact on the bottlenecks that you have in your app. The first of those is you got to know how to build a stack. I know we got some people in the room who are not super technical. So when we talk about a stack, we talk about uh, some servers in a place. Uh, not too long ago, when you wanted to do this, you'd have a server. You'd find a, a, a Dell catalog or something like that. You'd pick out which server is just right for you. You'd buy it. You'd get it shipped to some place that we call a co-location facility, which is a place where they plug your server in. And then you get your webmaster to install a bunch of stuff on there. And that's how the internet worked uh, not too long ago. Uh, I have a story that I can't tell the entire story, but uh, we had to file a ticket because a server wasn't turning on that was in a co-location environment, and the uh, person plugged, you know, rolled a cart down to the thing, plugged a monitor into it, and said, there's a screen, and it says there's a CMOS error. Press F1 to continue. End of message. <laughs> so, file a new ticket. Can you please press F1? <laughs> <laughs> I am super, super glad that I don't have to deal with that anymore. That is a bunch of nonsense. It has died for many good reasons. I am super glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. So nowadays, we have some basic stacks that all exist in these virtual uh, kind of cloud-based environments that we're going to call. Uh, this is an example AWS stack that I would recommend for Solidus. This is what I feel is the bare minimum that you should attempt to run Solidus on. In the middle is the key thing, and I, these are my application servers. And you know what, I have two of them. And the reason is that because they're really important, and if one of them goes down, I still have another one. Uh, on the left side, I have what we call the elastic load balancer. And the load balancer is the thing that receives your request from the internet and then sends it to one of your servers. On the other side of that, we have our RDS, which stands for Relational Database Service. And it's the thing that's responsible for storing most of the data that exists within Solidus. At the very bottom, I have this S3 thing, which is the Simple Storage Service. And it stores the images that are associated with products. If you've ever dealt with the cloud before, or you've ever dealt with some sort of hosting platform, I imagine a lot of this is going to look very familiar to you. This is what I would consider the bare minimum of what you should do Solidus on. You can run it on less, but you shouldn't. If you have a hobby store that you just want to throw on a digital ocean box or something, sure, go ahead. If this is something that actually makes you money and is actually uh, important to you, you should really strongly consider having a, a basic setup environment like this. So when we talk to people about what sort of environment they're running, uh, and you can use any sort of platform for this. I'm going to talk a lot about AWS because it's what I'm familiar with. It's been around for a long time, and it's the giant elephant in the room. There are other people who use hosted platforms like Heroku or something fancy like Google Compute Engine or other things like that. Uh, anybody use like the Azure Cloud or anything weird? No. A, lot, a lot of AWS people in the room, so I'm sure we're all familiar with this. The question is, this is my basic stack, and I want my store to get bigger. I'm going to be successful. Our stores tend to grow over time, and they eventually outgrow their server requirements. So the question is, if I feel that my current infrastructure is not good enough, what do I want to add next? You are always going to have a bottleneck in your application. This is something that you just need to accept. You need to be very happy with. There is no system in the entire world that is going to be able to handle an infinite number of traffic. If you go inter intergalactically viral, it's not going to help you. We only have so many resources. We're dealing with finite amounts of network space, finite amounts of CPUs, finite amounts of memory, and that's it. You can make it really good, but there's a certain amount of traffic that we could throw at Amazon, and it would kill a server, could kill their entire stack completely dead. The other thing to remember when we're talking about scalability is that developer time is more valuable than server time. 
I really value my time. I think it's worth a lot. Uh, servers are cheap these days. You can get T2 medium servers for like 40 bucks a month, and those are really, really good machines. You don't need to worry too much about these sorts of things. You should always, always, always consider throwing hardware at the problem rather than spending your valuable time in making this better. Now, you're going to need some time to analyze what hardware to throw at it, but going through the Solidus code, trying to further optimize things, while is a noble effort, is probably not where you should spend your time initially. Eventually, you're going to get to points where you're going to need to alleviate software-based bottlenecks, but whenever you can throw hardware at the problem, you should strongly consider doing so. So the question is, what sort of hardware do I want to throw at this? You can't answer any sort of reasonable questions about this without monitoring in place. So, for example, we have some, uh, a basic metric that we monitor at our ELB, uh, which is called average latency. What average latency measures is it measures basically the time when a request hits the ELB. It then sends that down the stack to my, web, my application servers. The application server sends back a response, and ELB then responds to the customers. That is what the average latency measures. Uh, it is a very important metric for scalability to determine how well your servers are dealing with your current load that you have. This is what I would call a not ideal but very reasonable graph of what your latency should look like. It's got some spikes. It goes up a bit. It goes down a bit. It's not a nice, flat, consistent, all the time uh, thing. But this is very reasonable. This is a graph going, through a, uh, going up into a big holiday sales season period. Uh, the question is, is like, you're going to see, start to see some patterns in this graph if things are not quite working right. I unfortunately had to draw some graphs because I never screenshotted some of these terrible things that I've seen in our, in our client sites before. But I've seen graphs that look like this. It goes up a bit, it goes down a bit, but generally it just kind of goes up and it goes up and it goes up. And then for whatever reason, it goes down. It might be taking 400 milliseconds on average for a bit, and then all of a sudden it's taking 150 milliseconds. And what generally is happening in this case is what we call a deploy-based cycle. Every time I deploy the website, it gets faster. And it's not because you made the code faster. It's because you've restarted your web server workers, and now all of a sudden everything is faster. In order to alleviate that problem, uh, we use a utility called Unicorn Worker Killer a lot. Uh, you may be familiar with this piece of code. And what it does is it's a gem that every so often it kills your workers and restarts them. When they've reached between 500 and 70, 750 max requests, it kills it, and then a new one comes in its place. If it starts consuming too much memory between 400 and 500 megabytes of memory each, uh, it's going to kill it and start up a new one. This is very important if you're running Unicorn in a production environment. Uh, you may look at your graph sometime. You go back home, go look at your average latency graph, deploy your website, and say, hang on, what happened there? Uh, it's probably that your unicorn workers have become slow and bloated. So I know some of you is on the back going to have a question. Um, hang on a minute. Wait about this. Why do I have to restart my unicorn workers every so often? Uh, isn't Ruby a modern, garbage collected, high performance programming language? Isn't there some sort of better solution than uh, turning it on again and off again? Unfortunately, there probably is. but. I found an answer that's true to my heart. And the answer to this is like, you know, should I investigate time in this? And my answer always is always, the answer is just don't think about it. It's not worth thinking about. It's not worth spending time on. I have decided that this is good enough for me. You're going to find this is a big common theme of the talk that I'm giving today is that I'm not about using the most cutting edge, bleeding edge technologies in order to try and solve problems that are easily solvable in more uh, traditional, more stable technologies. I know that maybe if I switch my workers over to Puma, it'll fix things. Maybe I won't need to restart them all the time. But maybe I'll have new problems. I'm not about, well, our stack doesn't work because of this one minor thing that I could fix fairly reasonably. So I'm going to migrate everything over to Google Compute Engine running in Docker containers. It's a, what can I do in order to make this a very reasonable path forward that I could reason get reasonable performance out of this under stable, well-understood technologies that have been working for us? In two years, I might say, you know what, I probably should have switched to Puma earlier. But having should have switched earlier is better than I should have switched much, much later. If you're not getting deploy-based cycles, another anti-pattern you want to look for in your latency graph is what I call a daily cycle. This is where your site's really fast in the middle of the night when the sun's down and everybody's asleep. And then when the sun comes up, your site gets slow again. 
You may also encounter some sort of daily based cycle based off of job processing or some sort of daily activity that leads to you, uh, you know, fulfilling all of your inventory between 7 and 8 a.m. in the morning as an example. If you're seeing a significant daily based cycle that is causing your average latency to you know, flip more than 20% between night and day, you likely are already having provisioning problems. You're likely having problems where you're not running enough application workers or you're not running a powerful enough database. And this problem is only going to get significantly exacerbated during a peak sales season like a Black Friday or holiday sales season. So if you look at your, if you look at your graph of your latency and you see this daily based cycle, you need to take a, look, a closer look at your stack, how it's configured and figure out what bottlenecks am I hitting already, knowing that during a peak time or if uh, a celebrity mentions your site, gets people to go to it, it's going to get much, much worse. The problem with all this is that figuring out is hard. It takes a long time to get data back from all of this. If I'm seeing a daily base cycle, the last thing I want to do is, well, I'm going to change this one thing and then roll it into production, then wait a week and see if it fixed it. I need to be able to program on this like I would normally program on this. I want to be able to iterate on it quickly and I want to be able to simulate the load that I'm getting. If it were something simple like I need to turn fast mode on in my configuration or tweak some weird variable somewhere and that makes everything better, this would be really easy. But no, it's figuring this out is hard. I'm going to need to be able to iterate on this. I'm going to need to be able to test this and simulate it somehow. Everybody should be familiar with a basic e-commerce funnel like this. Customers come into the page at, or come into your site at some point, like on the home page, category page, product page, and eventually you need to send them down further down the flow to the point where you want to check out. Every step of this thing, every step of this uh, funnel, people abandon and they go away. That's okay. We, we know it's going to happen. If I could get a 100% conversion rate on any of my stores, I would have retired a long time ago because I would just be so rich. But that's okay. It doesn't, doesn't always need to work like that. So when I'm talking about simulating load, I need to simulate load on all of these key endpoints in appropriate quantities. There's not going to be as many people checking out as there are hitting the home page. So I like to divide the load that I'm trying to simulate into a set of virtual user groups. There are four key virtual user groups that I want to uh, talk about today. The first are bouncers. These are people that they come to the site, they look at one page, and then they leave. I'm sure you've heard your marketing team talk about bounce rates uh, before. It's a very important metric for e-commerce that the more people you can get to stay on your site, learn about your products, maybe investigate them a little bit more, the more likely they are to, bad, to buy something. When somebody comes to your site, they look at it once and decide, no, that's it. We don't like that, but this is an important part of the traffic that comes to our website. When you're trying to identify what bouncers do, you want to take a look at either your analytics, talk to your marketing teams, or talk to people that know a little bit about where we try to drive traffic. Do we try to drive traffic to the home page by getting people to buy, type the domain name in? Do we send out email marketing campaigns? Do we do remarketing? Do we do targeted advertising on Facebook or some places to try and get people to go to certain pages? Those are the pages that people are likely to land on and therefore the pages that people are likely to bounce on. The next category that I want to talk about are browsers. These are people that they just come, they look around, they click on some category pages, they click on some product pages, but they never get so interested that they want to try and add something to their cart and they don't want to register or check out. I generally group these two people together as some sort of, you know, some old people that are too busy, distracted on the internet looking at pictures of cats, or maybe they saw some funny video that distracted them. There's this, there's this video where this one British kid bites this other British kid's finger. And it's Next thing I want to talk about is bailers. These are people that come to the site, they look around a little bit, they see something, they might be interested on it, they add it to their cart, maybe they register, maybe they log in, but at some point they decide, no, this isn't for me. They don't finish the transaction. They proceed a little bit further down the funnel, but this is another important user group for us to consider. The final group that we want to consider is the buyers. These are the people that uh, make money for our, uh, our, either our stores or our client stores or some people in general. They're my favorite people in the whole world. They come to our site and they buy something. They look around, they browse to products, they want to buy something, they want to register, log in, check out as guests, and then eventually they purchase something, sending us money. I want to try and determine of these four categories, what percentage of my users go into each flow. If we have some data around this, that's great. 
if we can take some random guesses around how many people just browse, how many people bail out during the checkout, how many people actually complete purchase, and how many people just bounce on the website, we're going to be OK. What I want to do is I want to use a load testing tool. There's a bunch of them out there. JMeter is a really popular one that's been around a long time. But there's some fancier ones written in JavaScript that I don't understand. But uh, you know, JMeter is no uh, spring chicken either. It's not a good tool. But I use it because it's been around for a long time. I want to determine which users are in each of these uh, groups. I want to figure out how I can simulate the type of load from each of these groups. And then I want to run the tests under increasingly high virtual user levels until either A, I'm satisfied that the site is going to do its job, we're going to be able to make it through the holiday season, or B, the site's broken, it's terrible, we're going to lose a bunch of money, uh, I need to fix this. So once I've reached one of those two situations, and almost certainly the flow is going to be uh, site sucks, site sucks, site sucks, site sucks. Hey, now the site's good. You're going to have to try this a bunch of times. You get to iterate on this and try and figure out what's going wrong here. The way I choose to implement some of these things is I create threads in my testing tool. So each thread is responsible for doing something. Some of them they do sometimes. They, sorry, sometimes they do the same thing. Sometimes they do different things. So I have five threads that are going to just bounce on the home page. They're going to hit the home page, and then they're going to go away. I'm going to have a few more that hit a category page, another one that hits a product page. Then I'm going to have some of these uh, browsers. They're going to go from the home page. They're going to click on a category page and bounce there. Some people are going to go a little bit further down. They're going to look at a few products. Then I'm going to get uh, people that look at a few category pages. Finally, starting at thread 16, 17, 18, I'm going to get some of these Baylor uh, uh, flows where they're going to go around, look for something, add it to their cart, and go away. And finally, the last two threads I have are buyer threads. It's important when you're implementing these that you consider all aspects of how your site and dependencies of your site are hit when these requests are made. For example, if I hit the home page, do I just hit the home page? Or do I make a third party API call? Or do I make some AJAX calls in order to figure out how many items are in my cart? Do I create orders for people using AJAX or things like that? It's important that all requests to your site that are important for scalability are, are taken account of in de defining each of these threads. What I want to do is I want to use my load testing tool uh, to execute these threads in a random order over and over and over again as a single virtual user. I then want to add more things that do the same thing until I can generate a sufficient level of load to test the thing that I'm going after. An important aside here is that TCP IP is amazing. If you ever wonder why the internet works at all, it's because there were some really, really smart people back in the day that when trying to define how computers are going to talk to one another, they made some really, really good decisions. We've seen a lot of really, really bad decisions that have, we've had to pay for over and over again. But TCP IP, the fact that it works and we haven't had said need to say, you know what, we really need to re-architect everything. Sure, they may not have known that this is going to become one of the biggest things in the world and therefore did not allocate enough IP addresses for us all. But if that's the biggest fault that they have, they still did an amazing job. It's important to consider because what's going to happen is that the client device is going to connect via TCP and it's going to hit our load balancer. Our load balancer is going to send a TCP request over to, in our cases, our Nginx servers. And the Nginx servers is going to communicate over sockets to our application servers. The thing about TCP IP is that if it doesn't get a response right away, it's, it's OK with that. It doesn't need to get responses immediately in order to be able to be satisfied with everything. It's willing to wait around. As such, a pattern that you need to be watching out for in your load testing is if you're getting requests that are being queued due to the in inherent uh, I'd say, wonder of TCP IP. An example of this would be a, a little table that I generated where it, while increasing in virtual users, we see that the server response time may, is basically the same. It's still taking your application servers the exact same amount of time to process a single request. However, the client response time starts to increase as the number of virtual users goes up. What's this, what this is likely showing is that you're either and Ginx server, or more likely your application workers, are too busy doing other things. They're not quite available to, uh, they're not available to respond to that request immediately. As such, your client response time starts to go up. 
This is a case where you have hit physical limits of your servers. However, everything still works. You're not getting 500 errors. You're not getting timeouts. But everything's getting slow. For me, this isn't good enough. I don't want everybody's Black Friday experience to be a functional but slow website. I want it to be awesome. I want it to be like it's any other day. That is basically my mantra for Black Friday. Black Friday should be the most boring day in the world for me. I have programmed the site well. I have provisioned the site well. And as such, a bunch of people are going to come to the site, buy a ton of things, and I'm not going to have to worry about it. If Black Friday is memorable for you, I'm sure you've heard talk to people that's like, oh, yeah, I remember the Black Friday of 012. That was not a good day for those people. It was likely not a good week afterwards. It was likely not a good month. They're still scarred by it. So you want to keep, a look, keep an eye on this to make sure that your client site is your, I should say, your load balancer is responding to your client in time. This starts to point to the areas that we see where our common bottlenecks are. The first is obviously at your application servers. You may not have a sufficient number of available threads or workers, or you might have enough workers, but you're using too much CPU in order for them to be effective. You can use monitoring in cases where if you're, likely, if you're seeing the client response time increase while your server response time remains the same, it likely means you don't have enough workers. If you're seeing that your CPU on your application server starts to get to the point where it's hitting 70, 80% CPU usage as user CPU usage, uh, that's another bad sign. You want your application servers to be pretty relaxed most of the time because they sometimes need to be able to do complicated things or they need to require a little bit of extra effort. Your other big source of, of slowness and bottlenecks is going to be in your database. Your database has a number of CPUs. You generally want the CPU number to be in the 10 to 20% range is where I like to see it. If during the, high, the peak of my day, my database server ne never gets above 20%, I'm a happy person. The reason that you want this to be so low is that it allows the database to respond very quickly. It keeps a, a fast site, a good response time for the users. It also gives you room to grow. If your database is at 50% and you get a big influx that uh, causes your traffic to double, now your database is at 100%. You get a big influx that causes your, your average load to triple, now your database is down. You don't want that to happen. Make sure your database is very well provisioned. It has a lot of breathing room to handle surges in traffic. I.O. on your database isn't as big a problem as it used to be because we have fancy new tools like lots of memory and solid state drives. But it's still something you want to be considering. If you're doing expensive queries that needs to read a large amount of data from a magnetic disk or write a large amount of data to a magnetic disk, you're likely going to be encountering problems and slowness on your database. It's going to take a long time to get the results of a query. Make sure that your database has sufficient I.O. And this used to be the number one thing that I would worry about. But since we have better technology now, I don't care about this as much. But it's always worth mentioning because sometimes you run sites that are weird, need to read and write a lot of data, and this is a big problem. The last thing that I want to mention in this talk is that there's, there's a complicated thing called lock contention. And it's something that's really important for us in e-commerce because we, we run a fairly write-heavy type of website. This isn't a blog or something where, or a news site where people come and they just read a lot. We need to write a lot of important things, like what someone is trying to buy, in what order, and how much they have to pay for it. Lock contention is where there are multiple resources trying to get exclusive locks on particular things. Sometimes tables. Often it's, uh, it's something as simple as the primary key index. In order to write something in there with a sequential index in a database, you need to make sure that you're getting the right number and it's not somebody else claiming that number. If you're in a situation where you're getting very high insert loads into tables like line items or orders, you can start to see some contention on, this date, on uh, the locks in these uh, databases. This is a big problem, and if you're encountering this, you want to consult somebody probably smarter than you that knows a lot about databases. I like people that are smarter than me because they can solve problems that just confuse the heck out of me. Lock contention is a big problem for, for some of these things because it can be hard to scale around it. If you're having issues with your locks in your database, it's like trying to add checkouts to a grocery store without adding additional debit machines. It's that it might be, you, know, you might think you're doing the right thing, but in reality, you haven't solved any problems at all. Other sources of bottlenecks you want to look at are external bottlenecks. How fast can my third parties respond? How fast can my payment gateways respond? How fast can my tax integrations, my shipping integrations, those sorts of things respond? It's important because every, you know, say, as an example, 
Your tax integration normally responds in 100 milliseconds, but on Black Friday, they start responding in two seconds. That extra 1,900 milliseconds is time that is being spent, consumed by your application workers, where they are sleeping, not waiting to do anything. It's a synchronous request. It needs to get a response before it can continue on. And if you're getting very big delays on these sorts of things, you will find that your application workers will get consumed very quick. There will be no application workers to service your customers. And all of a sudden, you're seeing 504 gateway timeouts. That's bad. The last thing you want to see for your, for your bottlenecks is, is actually bottlenecking your load testing server. I recall uh, not too long ago running a test thinking that everything was great, that the server was able to respond to all the requests I could send at it. I could send 1,000, I could send 2,000, I could send 5,000, and it would still work because I did an amazing job. Turns out the load server was overloaded, and it could not generate the traffic I was trying to get it to do. Therefore, it was not sending the load that I thought. You'll see this when your numbers start to not add up, where my virtual, my virtual user count continues to go up, but my actual number of requests served remains the same. Uh, you should run monitoring on your load testing server as well. If you find that your CPU is pinned at 100%, you've encountered load testing bottlenecks. You need more load testing servers to generate more load. But that's OK. That's an easy problem to solve. Another thing I want to talk about is caching, because it's important. Uh, there's two basic types of caching that I want to talk about. The first is passive caching, which is caching that you or I are not in control of. These are things like Rails, if you make the same query over and over again, it will hit your database once and then it will get it from memory again. If you've ever tried to optimize a query or find out why a query is performing slowly, you'll find that even when you execute the query once, you execute the same query again, uh, it ran a lot faster the second time. It doesn't seem to be a problem anymore. Things are cached at a lot of levels because there's a lot of smart computer scientists out there who have done some amazing things in order to make the, the uh, experience of using a computer faster. There's things like L2 cache in your CPU, memory, disk-based memory caches, those sorts of things, even outside of the realm of your application. The Linux kernel cache. These are things that store data in them, whether you know they're storing it or not. If you've ever looked at your free memory on a, on a Linux machine and you've seen, well, I have 100K of memory free, that's a problem. It's not a problem. Linux is just holding on to some of the stuff in case it decides it needs it later. But it's willing to give it back at any time. So remember that there's always passive caching in place that's helping you out. The caching that you have some control over is some things like the Rails view caching, which is built into Solidus. It's all over the place, uh, but not everywhere. The front end views make some, some somewhat extensive use of it. The API Rabble makes some extensive use of it. But the back end views don't. So if you have a lot of administrators that are doing a lot of weird things that's not based on the API, you might be encountering some issues where your application servers are doing a bit more work than they need to. Caching has its problems. Uh, touching. Anybody who's used caching knows what I'm talking about right now. For example, someone makes an order. That order has a bunch of line items in it. For every line item that's going to get shipped, it, it, it creates an inventory unit for a shipment. And then because the shipment gets, the inventory units get created, we get stock movements to take stock out of stock locations, which then causes the stock items to be decremented in their inventory loads, which then cause variants to do, oh man, it's like a lot of touching. And it's your variants, your products, your taxons. Every time you ship something, if you're running the default Solidus configuration, you have a lot of touching to do. This is a lot of updates on your database. And every one of these updates busts every cache that you have. So if, as an example, you're getting 100 orders a minute, you are busting your cache at least 100 times a minute. Uh, if so, how useful is your cache at that point if it's only good for 6 tenths of a second? You want to start thinking about this. I know I wanted, often wanted to say, like, no, no touching. That's it. I'm done with touching. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Thankfully, there's uh, some, some brilliant folks that uh, have a, a nice solution in Solidus that can really help you out on this front. And this is called the binary inventory cache. And uh, to me, this is Solidus fast mode. If you're a store that sells a lot of things, what you can do with the binary inventory cache is you can set it so that stock items will only touch their corresponding variants and products and such if its stock status has changed from in stock to out of stock. If you're a, if you're a store that reports exactly how many things you have in stock at any point, this is useless to you. If you're a store who only tells people if it is in stock or out of stock, you, you likely want to use this. It is, uh, it is very good. It helps eliminate a significant amount of update load on your website. Additionally, it helps eliminate a bunch of load on your application server because it makes your cache last longer. You are generally seeing, a, especially going into a holiday, you want to have a lot of stuff in stock. 
So stuff does not go out of stock as commonly as someone buying something. Uh, you should really strongly consider looking at this. It's a, one of the great configurations that we've added in Solidus. I want to talk about the backup plan. And uh, the, question, the answer is, uh, what backup plan? If it comes to the magic day where this is my big holiday and my site has not scaled enough, you do not want to be scrambling to fix things. I don't have a backup plan. I made my backup plan long ago, which is I'm going to make the site work. Uh, I know there's some people in the room who can tell some stories about bad, bad Black Fridays. Is Jordan around somewhere? Jordan can tell you some stories about bad, bad Black Fridays. It is not something you want to happen. You need to do your work ahead of time on this. You need to make sure that your site can scale. You need to make sure that you're going to be prepared to be able to handle a load to make Black Friday the most boring day of your work year. That's the basics of my talk. We're on to question time. You can clap now. We have an anonymous user who wants to know if I like curling. The, question, the answer is, yes, I do like curling. <laughs> I watch a lot of curling. It is a very popular sport in Canada, Scotland, and some northern European countries. If you're not familiar with what curling is, it's a thing where they have ice and rocks, and then they throw the rocks down the ice to the other end. It's actually a really interesting game to watch as a, as a spectator, because one of the things they do is they put microphones like this one on the player, which I just banged and probably ruined the levels on everything. But uh, you can actually hear them talk about the strategy of the game. Uh, and as they're playing it, second guess people. Uh, you know, similar to how people in, you know, when you're watching poker, you can see everybody's cards. You can kind of get into the heads of players and, and understand what's going on. So it's a popular Canadian sport, uh, or in Scotland, but not as popular here. So if you're considering, should I watch curling more? The answer is yes. Anonymous, you should use Puma. Troll, lo, 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 So, okay, why should I use Puma? Somebody tell me. Is it great? Is this person a troll? No one, no one wants to defend Puma. <laughs> Unicorn wins! Unicorn wins. Uh, next question is from Taylor Scott. He wants to know what testing tool do I use? Uh, by the way, the URL's at the top of the thing if you want to submit some more questions. I'm going to keep going through these. You can also upvote people or downvote those trolls. What testing tool do I use? I use JMeter and BlazeMeter. Uh, JMeter is a uh, Java-based tool that allows you to define things in a overly cumbersome XML format, which you can then upload to a tool like BlazeMeter, which provides a number of platforms for you to execute the, this load against your servers. I use it because I've been using it for a long time, and I know what it's. I know generally uh, what it does, and I'm generally satisfied with it uh, to the point where I still hate it, but I haven't tried an alternative, so I don't hate it that much. Martin, you got a question? I have not used that tool. However, I have looked into it, and I'm considering use it for my next time. So Martin was mentioning that there is a Ruby-based tool that turns Ruby-like syntax into JMeter-like XML in order for you not to have to write JMeter-like XML or use a cumbersome Java-based tool in order to define things. So I am generally pleased with, uh, with that answer, and I'm going to try using it sometime in the future. We have a question here from Sebastian Filou. I think that's how I pronounce it. I probably butchered it, but OK. My French isn't great. I'm Canadian, but I'm a bad Canadian. Do you execute load tasks on a staging server so you have the same architecture twice, production and staging? The answer to this is actually I do not execute them on production or staging. I spin up a very expensive performance-based environment that is a, basically an exact clone of a production-based environment. I don't run it all the time because it doesn't need to run all the time, but we spin it up. It has exactly the same data, number of database servers. It has exactly the, the same uh, instance types, the same uh, database, and a production-like dump of data. So this is production-like data that has been uh, anonymized, scrambled, or like important information removed from it, such that I don't actually do things. I try to make the performance testing as production-like as possible in order for me to be able to have a reasonable, uh, a reasonable 
confidence that what I'm doing is going to is going to behave the same in production. Uh, I talked a lot about rules earlier in, in sports, but I, I have some like Gregor's rules, and that is the thing that you don't test or the thing that you make different from your production environment will fail you on Black Friday. So. You try to make your testing environment as production-like as possible. So we've actually created a series of Ruby scripts that, uh, and maybe shell scripts, maybe something crazy, that uh, spin up a performance environment for us. They, they clone a, I shouldn't say they clone, but they create a new environment that basically mimics production and execute, data, and execute uh, performance tests against there. The staging server that we run is uh, not nearly at the same scale. The sta staging server that we run is small with a small database because only programmers and some internal people hit it. Next question is from Eric Saupe who asks, when you load test, do you disable scaling in order to test things like database load or any other bottlenecks? Uh, this is, I assume you're talking about some sort of inst or 20, what should I say? Uh, load-based scaling for EC2 instances and things like this. Uh, the question is yes, because we don't use load-based scaling. Uh, I find it is not responsive enough, and I want to be predictive rather than reactive in a lot of cases. However, if you are the type of site that gets uh, you know, random load jumps over a period of time, the thing I always find is that it's difficult to predict these sorts of things, and when they happen, they tend to happen immediately, and if I have an instance online in 10 or 15 minutes, it might be too late by then. So we just try to err on the side of caution that we have far more instances running than we actually need to in order to not have to deal with load-based scaling. So if I were doing that in a performance test environment, it would depend. I probably want to know how my site responds before the load-based scaling can, uh, can uh, respond. But I also might want to be in a situation where I want to know how I want to test my load-based scaling to figure out if I get a gradual curve of people waking up in the morning deciding, you know what, I need to go buy some stuff. Uh, that it's going to be able to handle that reasonably. We had a question from Edwin Cruz who's asking, what do I use to deploy C Capistrano? We actually do not use uh, Capistrano to deploy. We use a gem that's a, a stem bolt based gem called Oops, uh, which is the, oh, is it the Oops Opsworks Postal Service? Is it recursive? Yeah. yeah, okay. So this is a thing that runs in our Jenkins that packages up our, it packages up our code uploads it to S3, and deploys it into Opsworks. Uh, it is available and it's open source. I'm assuming we're the only ones who use it. Uh, I'm 99% like sure. But if you're curious about it, there's some uh, Oops developers around. It's really a really simple thing. It uploads a, a, uh, a zip file or a tarball of code, and that tar car code gets uh, shipped off to, op to S3, and then Opsworks gets triggered uh, to deploy it. So, my Yeah, we compile assets on Jenkins as well. So the, the, uh, it is a artifact-based deployment mechanism. Uh, monopoly, luck, or skill? Uh, both, uh, but however, there are better games. <laughs> uh, Locust.io, that's a thing. Uh, do you know any solid store running on JRuby? This is from Alessandro Lepore. I actually do not actively know of any solid store on JRuby. I, Think it should work? Daniel Honig's got one. You got one? So I think it should work. I'm not brave enough to try. We stick with MRI on a lot of things. Anybody wants to talk about the JVM 17? <laughs> Let's see. We got one more from Martin Tomoff. So the application and the server response times figures that you showed, do you take those metrics from AWS ELB interface or from the load tool? I get those from AWS CloudWatch. Uh, those come from AWS. Uh, it's a really important metric. If you're not looking at your latency metrics to figure out how your servers are performing in certain circumstances, you're probably not doing load uh, testing or scalability very well. So this is a, a really, really important thing to look at, and I want to know how my servers are, are responding. The load tool also gets a bunch of stuff, but the nice thing about these AWS metrics is that they're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week on my actual production boxes. So I can compare what happened in reality with what happened on my load tool to figure out if I'm seeing any things, that's, any things that are very similar. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna have to cut myself short, but I wanna thank everybody for listening today, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we're gonna be back in five minutes.